well, welcome back to Getting Past the Premium, everybody. We are here with our second episode in our two-part series with Steve Anderson, live from the Independent Insurance Agents of Nebraska Convention. And we're going to focus the conversation today on his best-selling book, The Bezos Letters. And there's so many things in this book that apply to our industry that we're going to try to condense it down into an episode and, and give a ton of value to everybody. So enjoy the show, and we'll catch you next time. Welcome to the Getting Past the Premium podcast, where we focus on breaking down risk management problems bit by bit until we find a solution. If you would like to discuss anything you hear on GPP with us, please reach out using the links in the description. Enjoy today's episode. All right, well, thanks for coming back or sticking with us. Or staying with you. My pleasure. (laughs) Um, I'm excited for this one. I have read the book, um, and I I just, we were talking before that there's so many things that I felt like applied to our industry, our own firm, and I know you're doing your speech today to the convention on the book and the principles, so I'll maybe let you start there on kind of what you're you're going to be talking about, because there's, there's a lot of different ways we could go with this and what is most applicable kind of to the industry. And I would also be curious, from my own knowledge, how you kind of came <laughs> I was gonna to say, that's usually, writing the book. Uh, and, what, uh, what's an insurance tech yeah. guy know about writing a book? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a very appropriate question and probably a good place to start. Um, so it actually comes out of my work in technology and the industry. Um, the Agents Council for Technology is a group uh, so, uh, sponsored by uh, the National Big Eye, and I've been part of that literally from its beginning. And one of the work groups a few years ago that we put together was called The Changing Nature of Risk. And the purpose of that was to help agents understand the uh, increasing variety of technology that was coming out. What is it? How does it apply to my clients, to us as an agency? What do I need to know to do the proper insurance protection? So some of our early stuff was around Uber and Lyft, right? And Mm -hmm. I think maybe now we all know some of the insurance coverage questions that surrounded that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we delved into that. We delved into Bitcoin early a few years ago. I mean, so all kinds of different things. I think we ended up doing... I want to say 10, 15 maybe, what we called risk advisory. So one page, front, back, PDF, quick summary of technology. Hmm. So through that process, I, I started thinking, is the biggest risk agencies face, and then I've expanded it out to, is the biggest risk businesses face today actually not taking enough risk? right? And so for an insurance guy... Yeah, it's like what um, you know. Everything we do is to mitigate risk, to prevent it, or you know, financially get somebody back to the where they were before in an accident. All those kinds of things. But businesses today don't have the luxury of ten, fifteen, or twenty years ago, and take six, twelve, eighteen, twenty-four months to study a new technology, figure out what is it, how does it affect us. They maybe have three to six months if that. And so I started looking at firms, companies um, that had done it well and those that hadn't. And, you know, the hadn'ts, I think we all kind of know. Kodak, Blackberry, Blockbuster, (laughs) CompUSA, Borders, right? All kinds of different types of companies that were once extremely successful, Mm -hmm. top of the heap, and then they weren't. Yeah. You know, and I would say all of a sudden it wasn't quite that way. But what was the difference between them and a company like Amazon? And so I looked at Amazon. I think people know it's grown exponentially from a garage startup in uh, 1994 to, you know, almost a you know, trillion and a half company, one of the most valuable companies in the world today, in 27 years. How, how does that happen? Unbelievable. And as I was starting researching that, I came across the letters to shareholders that Jeff Bezos wrote. So they went public in 1997. He wrote his first letter in 1997. It was published in the spring of 1998. And has written a letter every year since. Um, the book goes through 2018 uh, letter. <clears throat> and I literally remember reading a couple letters and then going, wow, 
there's a lot of stuff in here. <laughs> um, and then I sat down over a few days and literally read every single letter straight through as, as one narrative and came away really, my mind was blown because I felt like Bezos revealed what I now call hidden in plain sight, mm -hmm. his secrets for growing Amazon. And then um, it, 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 I think they apply to any business and, and certainly from the agency perspective too. Um, so you'll appreciate this, maybe alluding to our mm -hmm. earlier conversation. I created a lead gen, which was a one page executive summary of each letter. PDF, gonna put it on my website, Give me your name and email address, and you can download it for free. Yeah. And fortunately, I am married to the world's best book strategist editor who actually works for a book publishing company. So I did have a little bit of a sweetheart <laughs> deal or, a, or an end to getting a book published. Um, but she looked at I showed it to her, and I said, and I talked to her about what I was reading and thinking, and she said, that's not a lead gen, that's a book. And then I went, Oh crap! <laughs> yeah, no, I gotta write a book. Seems well, like a bigger project. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a little more than um, yeah, just a, a simple lead <laughs> gen. So that literally started the process, and again, I'll shortcut this piece because it was about two years um, to get this published. Uh, I actually started uh, with another book called The Risk Dilemma, kind of back to that original mm -hmm. question, um, and. and Again, bottom line, it was boring. So <laughs> that book has never seen the light of day, but I took pieces out of that book into this. Um, and, and so what I did was came up with 14 principles. I call them growth principles that Amazon used to grow. Um, those principles are grouped into four cycles. So test, build, accelerate, and scale. And obviously, we don't have time to talk about all 14, but I think there are a few that seem to resonate with people just kind of off the bat. I, and actually, I'd be interested, you know, what was the thing you walked into the oh, office and, and thought, okay, we need to think about yeah. that, because that could be, you know, a great way to do the conversation, too. But let me, let me start with the principle number one, and it's in the test cycle. So one of the secrets at Amazon to their success is experimentation. Um, and our industry and most industries right now talk about the need to innovate. And I think that's backwards. Businesses don't need to innovate. They need to invent. And I think, frankly, that when we talk about insurtechs, they haven't invented anything new. They barely innovated. A, mm -hmm. Maybe a bit better customer engagement yeah. process. But at Amazon, Bezos says in one of his letters, Amazon is the best place for an employee to fail because we encourage successful failure. And that's the first principle, encouraging successful failure. And what Bezos says is, <clears throat> if you're going to invent, you have to experiment. And if you're going to experiment, you have to be able to fail. Mm -hmm. Because if it's, an, if it's an experiment that you know is going to work, it's not an experiment. Yeah, you don't know if you got lucky. You don't know if you got lucky. You don't, you don't know anything, <laughs> yeah. right? And failure is what leads to success. Yeah. Now, what's the successful failure? You don't typically hear those two words together. Well, it's this idea, um, and again, I, I won't go through the whole story. Read the book. Yeah. But uh, it really comes out of the Apollo 13 mission with mm -hmm. NASA. I'm a big space geek and um, was really intrigued, but... Um, in the movie Apollo 13, Ron Howard's directed, great movie, really accurate, pretty accurate, too, of what happened. Um, Jim Lovell, excuse me, Tom Hanks, who plays Jim Lovell, the commander, is stepping off the helicopter after they returned, got out of the ocean, and he's narrating, and he says, um, our mission became known as NASA's most successful failure. And that just grabbed me. Mm -hmm. And Still, obviously, I wrote about a whole, you know, principle around that idea. So let me give you one example of a successful failure for Amazon. The Fire Phone. <laughs> 2014, Jeff Bezos got up on a stage in New York City, kind of trying to look like Steve Jobs. Not done very well, <laughs> but... Um, and announced that Amazon was, has, was releasing today a new phone. Mm -hmm. Now think, 2014 iPod came out in 2007. We still had, excuse me, I, 
phone came out in 2007. We had Android phones already. Who needed another phone? We had already made our decisions. 20th anniversary of the iPod last week. I know. And by the way, that's another interesting sidelight. But Apple consciously um, cannibalized their iPod sales by putting the iPod in the iPhone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a whole interesting thing, yeah. right, for growth, et cetera. So now it's the Fire Phone. I, it had a few technical things that were sort of gimmicky. It basically was shop on Amazon easier. <laughs> yeah. Who cares? Well, nobody did. And at one point, they lowered the price of the phone to 99 cents and couldn't give it away. <laughs> At the end of 2014, they wrote off $178 million in development and inventory costs. Failure. Utter failure. And it was Bezos' pet project. He thought it was a great idea. Four months after the, I, uh, the uh, Fire Phone was announced, Bezos got his first demonstration of a cylinder that sat on a table that you could ask it a question and it would answer you. Echo hardware, mm -hmm. Alexa, the machine learning software to be able to do that. I think you would say that that has become a pretty good success. I would. And, and so the, the point there is the hardware team that built the phone, what they learned in voice processing and a, a whole bunch of other things there, they transferred into the hardware device that we know as Echo and now all the various options there. So that's the idea of successful failure. What are you doing with what you learn and how are you repurposing that? And Amazon, again, I always have to say, Amazon absolutely is not a place to go and just wing it. They don't wing anything. So this is not just throwing something against the wall and seeing what happens. It's very intentional. It's thoughtful. They have a very specific process of how they come up with the product idea and how they test it and how they experiment and figure out what's going to work and not going to work. Um, but I tell agencies all the time, I don't know if this or that's going to work. Experiment with it. Mm -hmm. Try it. You don't know. Don't just say no. Try it and see. And one of the phrases Bezos uses all the time, which I love, is we invent on behalf of the customer. We invent on behalf of the customer. There's a reason why Amazon has multiple mega hit businesses in very different areas. Right now, it's certainly consumer, right? Website, sales. But think about AWS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whole different, not consumer, developer, but at one point, they had built their own infrastructure, yeah. and they realized in a meeting, hey, there might be other developers that would want access to some of these tools, right? And, and at a cost where you don't have to buy server racks and write all the stuff you used to if I was going to create something new, new software company or whatever. So, uh, and, and then, <clears throat> I mean, a point to a several, Marketplace, Amazon Marketplace. So... Early 2000s, Amazon made the decision to allow third-party non-Amazon sellers on their site. But that was the third iteration back to experimentation. Mm -hmm. They had two other ones that were failures. But they finally figured out what to do. Marketplace now accounts for almost 60% of all sales on Amazon. But think of the crazy counterintuitive business. Would you allow your competitor to have a listing on your website that you've spent billions of dollars developing and marketing for a similar product. But here's what Bezos said. If a third party seller has a product in inventory and we don't, that's better for the customer. If they have a price that's better than we can do, that's better for the customer. And if it's better for the customer, it ultimately will be better for Amazon and our shareholders. Yeah, we'll win. Will win. And, and well, that's the obsess over customers. That is, obsess that's over cool, customers right? is another one, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, in, in the build cycle, obsess over customers. And, and, and this is always so interesting to talk about because people go, oh, I take care of my customers. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. They take it to a whole other level. They take it to a whole other, another level. And, and frankly, you know, one of the things I've been kind of thinking about and exploring have they taken it too far? <laughs> so you hear a lot of negative about Amazon with their fulfillment center workers and, you know, some of those yeah. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. 
And if you don't understand obsess over customers, you won't understand why they push so hard for higher productivity because that person wants that package. Mm -hmm. Two days, one day, same day, mm -hmm. few hours. And that logistics to put that in place are astounding to make that happen. And, and that is Bezos' words, obsess. That's not a word you hear very often with customers. You hear customer focus, customer journey, customer service, yeah. right? All kinds of different things. Well, then the meaning's different for, you know, <clears throat> we're not operating on the same definition. Correct. Of, uh, so real quick, uh, Steve, I, I want to tie this back to, you know, a 10-person agency. Mm-hmm who's sitting in the middle of America because we still hear all the time. Like if you want to grow, just dial the phone or um, go out and knock on doors and meet people and da, 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 da. You know, what can you do if you're the 10, 12 person agency in the middle of America to start this experimentation process and how to innovate. And I'll take that a step further into, you know, changing the way that you think about business from operating in books of businesses to working on the business. Mm -hmm. Cause that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Like one person <clears throat> innovating, sitting in an agency is not going to get you where you want to go, but changing the way that your company operates by spending time experimenting on the business You've got a shot. So like, can you, with your experience, kind of walk through that with me a little bit? Sure. Several things come to mind. Um, I, I certainly resonate with the phrase work on your business, not in your business. <clears throat> um, and that first got planted in my brain probably in the 80s with Michael Gerber's book, uh, The E-Myth, Entrepreneurial Myth. Yep. Uh, if you haven't read it, read it. It's still, even though it's written long time ago has a lot of great things in it um i think the i mean I, 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 i'm thinking of alluding back to our earlier conversation um in the prior episode if you didn't listen to it go listen to it um where we talked about like using loom as a personalized to me that's an easy experiment mm -hmm. meaning oh i don't like myself on video well who cares you know this is something it's reasonable to think it's worth trying it out and seeing what kind of different engagement you get. Mm -hmm. That can be done on you know an individual basis, even in a small organization. I think the issue here is partly mindset. So I'll go back to customer obsession. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, when you were even talking about that, you you started with agencies and then you said, you know, I think companies maybe or business owners. <clears throat> I think it's like a society issue. It is. I mean, I catch myself as a parent telling my kids like, hey, don't go too fast down the street. You're going to wipe out. Or we're constantly trying to be in this protective mode. Right. Instead of going out and saying, you know, hey, yeah, I mean, go as fast as you want to. You're going to figure it out. Right. Maybe that's a bad <laughs> example with your kid on the bike. But uh, <laughs> my point is, is that, you know, we're always like, you need to put your coat on, it's cold outside from a very young age in society. And I'm wondering how that's translating into how we operate today. Well, and, and I would say the core of the book is I call Bezos the master of risk um, in how he thinks about risk as an advantage, not as something to protect against. And, and again, that's where words can he was somewhat limiting. He doesn't do stupid things, but right. he's willing to try things and is willing. And again, I'm thinking of various phrases in his letters. Um, one phrase that sticks out right now is, he, he, you know, too many companies have unwarranted risk aversion, meaning they're not. And actually, he. I'll end my presentation today talking about the, the uh, believe it's always day one concept 
you know, though he would consider that a day two company, a company that's <laughs> on its way out. Right. Right. It's it's lost its ability to adapt and uh, engage appropriately with customers. And I think those kinds of things apply regardless of size and regardless of industry. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and that's certainly one of the things the, the book certainly has done for me is broadened uh, that perspective a little bit more than just insurance agents and brokers. I think it absolutely applies to them, probably applies to them more than a whole lot of other businesses because agencies see the worst that can happen every day. They are naturally risk averse and that's not serving them well in today's world. In running a business. Yeah. And running their business. Well, I think a couple things that, that, you know, you mentioned what I took out of the book and applied earlier, but because I think it fits right along with this, that, that if you think about how an insurance agency grows as well, a lot of times it's one agent starting out maybe with one support person or whatnot that came with them and building their book, that's the business. Mm -hmm. And so that could be years of <clears throat> doing that. And I think then it's, it's hard if you're not building a business from the start to make that shift. And it really takes this mentality of experimentation, um, taking on risk, those types of things. And one thing that was in the book that I think is so applicable, but that our industry is terrible about is I think it's 70%, right? Where Jeff Bezos says, yes. it, you, so you, you get more than that. You, yeah, yeah. You can. So the, it, the principle is um, high velocity decision making and talks a lot about how to make decisions and he calls them type one, type two. Uh, and, and the what I've you're already alluding to use that by the way. Are, is this type one or type two decision? Yes. <laughs> <He knows. laughs> yes. And there are the problem is there are very few type one decisions yeah. that a business makes. There are mostly type two decisions. But as a business grows, as an agency grows, the tendency is to take type two decisions into a type one process. Mm -hmm. Meaning you've got to get multi-level approval, and all that does is slow growth. And so the your point. What Bezos said is you should make a decision with at most 70%, but here's the key to that phrase, of the information you wish you had. Yeah. Not the information you have, but you wish you had. And because type 2 decisions are ch easily changeable, mm -hmm. you know, again, his... Uh, low consequence stuff. Low consequence, and his illustration is doorways, right? Type 1 decisions, you walk through that door, it's really hard to change, to walk back. Type two decisions, you walk through that door, you look around and say, nah, this isn't working. Boom, pivot, change, go back through the door, through the door yeah. the low door. consequences. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something that um, Amazon does amazingly well. And uh, kind of the extension of that 70% is, and made by a team of highly skilled individuals. So Amazon has very little bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. It's all about small teams. Um, and again, the phrase that uh, Amazon is two pizza teams. Mm -hmm. So a team is no bigger than what two large pizzas can feed. <laughs> yeah, which I think is great. But And I think just to, if we're using that on the analogy on an insurance agency, that that's where I feel like we get the, we mentioned on the last episode, that's not the way we've always done it is because of that book of business, you know, that that business owner is has their clients that they've built the business on and it's like that protection. They don't want to lose any of those. They want to, and to be clear, we don't want to take risks with our insurance clients yep, coverage no or anything like that. But with the business, you know, it's different. We should figure out ways to propel that, you know, invention, innovation, whatever the word is you want to use, but you're not going to have you're not going to be able to make that decision with 100% of the information or you're never going to do it. Right. And I think, but I, that's just where we get stuck in. As it a, is. It, it's like it's across the industry and it it's hard for me to... Well, think of insurance companies. Oh, my goodness. It's kind of the yeah. maybe worst example of that. You know, trying to yeah. get anything done. And again, think about that bureaucracy level of how you have to get approvals versus a trusted, highly capable small team of people that says, we're going to try this and not have to go. Mm -hmm. And again, the key is having management, whatever that might look like, um, not punish for failure. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I quote a friend of mine who said this in the book, 
Um, I believe people are not afraid of failure. They're afraid of the consequences of failure. Mm -hmm. And when you create a culture in a company of not willing to embrace failure, you're not going to Get, you're not going to try new things. I mean, it's yeah. just not going to happen. Yeah, you're going to stifle all of that. You stifle all of it, right. I feel like insurance companies take on a lot of risk with their float money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah. you know, like it's, uh, they're almost like gaming the independent agent a little bit on. Well, and I think too, it's like, I feel like Amazon gets a lot of uh, leeway too, because people know like the fire phone, you know, they're willing to take a risk maybe to go out and buy the phone because typically Amazon does pretty good. Yep. And if it fails, we're willing to be like, okay, I'll go back to my phone. I'm probably going to buy the next thing that they try. Right. Um, I feel like we don't have that same mentality as an insurance agent or industry. Well, and think, of, think about an, an, even your, you know, example of a 10, 12 person agency and quote the, you know, new latest, greatest insure tech. Well, I tried the X before and I wasted my money. Yep. Okay, you experimented, didn't work. Why not? Have you have you done a, a debrief, you know, review, uh, yeah. debrief, whatever, to to try and understand what happened and what went wrong? Um, but not being able to move forward, you know, again, I think it's just such a well, hard be, place to be. And I'd be curious your perspective on this because I feel like our clients. If we are out telling them we, we have this deep relationship, we have a great relationship with them, and we're telling them, hey, we're, we're trying to innovate. We're trying to come up with new and better ways to deliver this product to you and to protect you and all these things. Sometimes those are going to fail. And you know, and they know that. I would feel like our clients would know when, when one of those does fail, we, we implement a new technology to communicate with them and it doesn't work very well. Right. They're going to give you the grace to say, I well, get and it, I, you guys. And, you know? and I can think of you know, mobile apps, yeah. chat bots on website. I mean, there are a number of things. And again, I constantly hear, oh, that didn't work or nobody engaged with it or nobody did anything. Well, why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, what what have you done to try and make that work better? And maybe it won't work. Then you pull the plug and that's fine. And if your client knows that you're trying to do these things to better their, to experience, better their experience exactly, and that some of them are going to fail, they're going to give you the grace to Continue. It's the clients that you don't have a good relationship with, or whatever. That right. all of a sudden try to communicate you with you. Get the chat bot. They're like, well, what the heck? They're just trying to, you know, right. do away with me. And then, yeah, they are probably going to leave. But right. I think, again, it's that because Amazon obsesses over their customers and they've built that loyal following, they've built a lot of credibility through these different things. They have the ability to. Uh, fail in some of those, and, mm -hmm. and they do learn from. But all the things that we've talked about, and they create f fans. Yes. Yeah. Uh, raving, raving fans. fans. Yeah. And I can't help but to think that goes back to the relationship. It does. You know, and, I, and I did sign up, side note, for Amazon's robot oh, to, to be part of the, the, the uh, early beta. Or early beta. Yeah. And think so, about that. So that's a great example. Think about that. So Amazon announced a, I forgot, an Astro. Is yeah, that yeah, the name of it? Right. Yeah. Astro. Uh, it can't go upstairs yet, but uh, freestanding robot that will follow you around your house with yeah. a you know kind of an echo screen on it, and um, they are think about this interesting. So you signed up, it's fifteen hundred dollars, thousand, thousand, sorry, okay, thousand dollars. What are they going to learn from you? And you're paying for the privilege. Yeah. That's well, not I've, bad. I'm, I'm gonna just saying. To, I'm going to have to put underwear on now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was. But maybe because of that, they won't uh, yeah. They won't let me in the trial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but but again. Yeah. When they're they're going to learn everything. They're going to learn all kinds of things. And they're going to iterate. Uh, uh, again, another quick example. 2006, Bezos wrote... I'm often asked the question, when are we going to open physical stores? And long answer there I won't go into. 2015, they opened their first bookstore, Amazon Books. Now, what happened between two, and basically what he said, and again, this is a really interesting phrase, we haven't figured out how to have a meaningfully differentiated customer experience in retail. Bingo. Until they did. Mm -hmm. okay. And so... A bookstore, and actually the one I love to use is the Amazon Go Store, which came out, I think, in 17. So convenience store, you know, 1,000, 1,500 square feet, typical chips, prepackaged sandwiches, you know, drinks. Yeah. But 
you walk in, scan your app to get in, the doors open, and you walk around, pick stuff off, put it in your bag, and you literally just walk out. So there are cameras and sensors, and they know what you have put in your bag and what you walked out Didn't with. Didn't you try and say oh, a little scared to walk Oh, it felt out. like I was shocked with <laughs> yeah. <you>. Absolutely. <laughs> in fact, I took my wife there on another trip. She had to, she had to look around. It's like, I can just walk out? Yeah. Yes, she can. Yeah. So now they're building that into uh, larger grocery stores. Not Whole Foods, but that's coming, I think. Mm-hmm. Again, you think about yeah. that experiment process and that's a long time. Yeah. I mean, 2006 to now, they continue to experiment with having a different customer experience. Their goal with Amazon Go and all of this was to remove the biggest friction point in shopping. Retail. Mm-hmm. Checkout. Checkout, yeah. Think about that. That's a lofty goal. Well, in the bookstore is, and I know we're at, we're probably over time, but the bookstore is quite a bit different too, right? It is. You know, most bookstores have a hundred and however many. I, you know, I was in a, I was in a Barnes and Noble over the weekend, and huge, you know, mega store. We've all seen that. Probably a hundred, hundred twenty five thousand titles in yep. in the store, an Amazon bookstore probably has um, maybe twenty five thousand square feet, not one hundred and fifty thousand square feet. Um, And the difference is Barnes & Noble has to stock the book they think you're going to want to buy. Amazon Books doesn't. You don't go to an Amazon bookstore to get a book you know you want to read. What do you do? You just get it on. You order it. Yeah. And it shows up either 60 seconds on a Kindle or next day on a, you know, a physical. Um, And so you, but you do go to an Amazon book store to discover the next book you might want to read. Mm-hmm. And so they mimic what you see on the website. So they have you know, one area where if you read this, you might like these, right? Think about that on the website. So and they've they're taken, all and they're all, 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 I would say 90% of the covers are facing out. Because yeah. people, they know, people want to see the cover, not the spine. Because mm-hmm. it, I mean, think about it. The spine's really hard, right? Yeah. Hard to read, hard to pick out. Uh, hard, hard to explore. Well, I think it just goes back to changing that client experience. Um, thinking about the client experience. Thinking, yeah, thinking about it. <laughs> well, and I, again, for, so my phrase for insurance agents, and I use this all the time, is what are you doing to take friction out of the transaction process with your clients? Yeah. And do you even know where they are? Yeah. Most would not. Probably. Mostly not. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a friend, non-insurance friend, who wrote recently that you know about forms so like doctor's offices mm-hmm. and he said i got and i got from my insurance agent you know like an eight page application and they already had everything i already had done this and so he said i wrote on it on file and sent it back <laughs> but think about that as a friction point mm-hmm. now we go in the agency well we have to we have have to have a new app well why don't we pre-fill Everything that you already haven't let them up. I mean, right. And there are some technologies now to help with that process, but we don't think about it because we don't obsess over customers and we haven't done it that way before. Yeah. But that, think about those friction points. Yeah. Well, I, again, I think we're, we're probably over time. We, I think we've talked about two of the principles. <laughs> so there, I mean, that is the challenge. Yeah. By the way. Absolutely. We could go on again, like usual, with these, but. Um, I would encourage everybody to get the book. What maybe give them an idea? It's uh, certainly on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if you do get the book, uh, go to the web book website, which is thebezosletters.com. And there's some additional material, workbook to help you. There are questions at the end of every chapter. Because the purpose of the book is, yes, yeah, I think interesting. I think it reads well. But really, the purpose of the book is to help you think about how your business, working on your business, right? How your business might change and adapt to uh, some of the things that Amazon has proven are successful. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite things to do is to think about, as I experience other, engaging with other businesses, could be completely different from the insurance industry, but how does that apply to what we do? Right. And I think, that, you know, again, the book gives exactly how Amazon has done that over right. time. So. Well, thanks again for sticking with yeah, us. That's great time, Steve. Episode. Appreciate yeah. it. And, uh, My pleasure. We'll look forward to your speech here in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thank you for tuning in to Getting Past the Premium. 
we are excited to continue breaking down barriers and finding solutions together. If you would like to reach out regarding anything you heard in today's episode, find links and contact info in the description. Until next time, have a great day, and let's continue getting past the premium.